Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. We're going to cover Unit 15, Managing for Diversity with Agroecology. <clears throat> Here is a picture to start her out with um, where they're actually putting wildflowers down in, in order to do the uh, diversity. Um, if you look, there's a crop off to the left where these two people are actually walking. It looks like they're walking right along the crop. But this is an area that's been prepared and they're putting some wild flower seeds down and that's going to attract some of the pollinators to help create some of that diversity. Um, and just a quick overview of what we're going to kind of look at in this section. Basically, since we started agriculture many, many, many years ago, we've pretty much been displacing uh, our natural terrestrial ecosystems. In other words, we've been making changes to that system since its beginning creating interferences with that. Pretty much they've had a negative impact um, on us and all the organisms around it. Um, some of the things that has caused the largest disruption or because there's been that much change has been mining and urbanization. Mining, they're digging down in the ground or they're opening up strip mines. There's both kinds of mining. Um, both of them have had influences on in terms of um, some of the deep mines there's some of the surrounding soils are being affected by it. Sometimes they're pumping water that's not real good out of some of the ore mines that are creating some, and we've seen that in some of the earlier units of this uh, class where it's had an effect on the um, ecology of the area. And then urbanization, of course, we have less and less and less land that we're farming every year. Um, and urbanization is just creating that area where you're no longer farming it and using it to create food you're using it for people to live on. Um, <clears throat> so there's been many, many environmental changes due to what we've done in agriculture, especially over the last 60, 70 years. Um, pretty much there's been a pretty big belief that, or there's a certainly the bandwagon's getting larger, that you know agriculture and the ecology around it is very very important because it's the support systems for the world and we didn't realize it right away but some of the things that have been happening is this changes that we need to worry about is the greenhouse grass gases that are out there in other words we're creating an environment where there's co2 that's being created carbon monoxide being created that's not positive and then there's been an ozone depletion uh, we got into that in um, some of the prior units talking about that ozone depletion and we have that the hole in the ozone that's getting less and less but um, things we need to worry about um, here's an example of stuff we've lost and here's an example of um, a conservationist that's trying to help um, cutthroat trout a bonneville cutthroat trout back into an area and trouts would be the ones that would go downstream and then they'd spawn and then they'd fight their way back upstream. Um, and it was it's an amazing phenomenon. If you Google that and look at that, how that happens, it's kind of a neat process. But here's where they're trying to reintroduce it. We've changed areas so much that it cut out a lot of the areas in which these trout could do what they wanted to do. So they're trying to reintroduce some of those uh, environments again, some of those ecologies again. Um, what is the goal in this? And in this unit, what we're going to look at is what can we do to reverse this degradation we've had to the ecological environment in which we live. So things that are going to we're going to have to worry about, we're going to have to conserve the resources that we have. We only have a finite finite amount of those biotic resources. It's not infinite. It doesn't come forever. So what we've pretty much determined through what we've done so far is that we have to become more sustainable and environmentally friendly. We have to be concerned about the ecology of the area in which we live, which means we have to protect the environment. We have to increase the diversity of that. What has been found out is the more diverse an ecology is, the more it's better able to handle any curveballs that might be thrown at it, horrible storms, droughts, floods, those types of things. And then, of course, because we've done all these things over the last 60, 70 years to put in the external inputs, namely <clears throat> mechanization of farming um, using the synthetic uh, pesticides, herbicides, and um, 
the GMO crops that we're going to have to rely less on that and try to get more back into something that's sustainable for the long term. Um, here's an example of um, total change in total cropland between 2002 and 2007. And surprisingly, in some areas, that there's been an increase um, by 5,000 acres and you'll see in an area that has that blue dot. So if you're looking at the dots going across here, you can see the majority of those changes are from pretty much Indiana, the Midwest, uh, and then there's a little bit out east in the Carolinas, Georgias, and Floridas. And I mean, it's not that it isn't everywhere, but the majority of what's been happening, North Dakota has a, a huge amount. What that means is that the acreage has increased in that specific point by 5,000 acres. But more interestingly, the red is where there's been a decrease in acreage that was used for crops. And if you look at it, between 2002 and 2007, the net decrease has been 27 million, roughly 27 million acres. So that's a big, big, big change uh, from what it's been. Um, what I'm thankful to say, too, this is the last um, chart they have that shows like this. It's actually leveled out where it's kind of it's staying the same. It's not decreasing or increasing. It's about the same between 2007 and now, and that's a very good thing. This next chart is showing us the number of farms, and um, what we see here is that if you have a blue dot, there's been a 20 farm increase where that dot is wherever the blue dot is, and then if there's been a decrease of 20 farms or more, there's um, one dot that is red. Uh, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of the chart, we can see that between 2002 and 2007, there's been an increase of 75,000, almost 76,000 farms. Um, and, and of course, the number of farmers doesn't indicate always, but what that's showing us is pretty much it's the small farmers, the organic, that type of stuff is is there's more and more of that happening, and that's a, a positive thing. And it's it stayed pretty pretty steady, a little bit of an increase from 2007 on. So that's a very good thing too. Um, some of the stuff we're going to look at, try to analyze a little bit, is and we should look at is what are the soil erosion rates. In other words, how much of our dirt that we have on our area that we're farming is eroding off, and we won't be able to use it. Um, Fertilizer usage, uh, how much fertilizer we're using that's synthetic and how much is natural. Uh, same with pesticides, that we're getting rid of uh, bugs and diseases. Uh, if there's any irrigation taking place, try to analyze what that is and if it has any effect on the environment. Uh, look at the crops that they're planting on a specific farm. And then look to see that there is more diversity because diversity certainly is going to help go a long way to increase how sustainable uh, it is and, in fact, how well the ecology is going to increase. Once we've determined that on a small scale and gotten it to work and done that analysis for it, it's not just analyzing and say, oh, okay, now that we know that, we're going to do that everywhere. You can roll it out to a larger scale, but it's going through those experiments to figure out what it is and for a specific area because there are differences in every area. And then just try to keep that and keep going larger and larger and larger. And then eventually we'll have an ecosystem that's very nice in a very large area. But it's going to take a lot of time. Um, some of the things at a farm level, that small level that you can do, um, finding out that if you increase the size of the non-crop areas um, and you have more abundant and multiple varieties that you're planting, you're going to have a much, much better chance that you're going to have a sustainable farm. Um, changing farm practices that reduce the amount of non-synthetic or decrease the amount of synthetic and interference type things. So reducing or eliminating pesticides, irrigation, and inorganic um, fertilizers Synthetic fertilizers is what's really going to help. Uh, the reduce the amount of tilling that you do. So the less you disturb the soil, the better off it's going to be, the more sustainable it's going to be. And then re reduce the amount of time that there's no crop cover. In other words, once you get a crop out of there, 
get your cover crop in there, just don't let it lay so the soil is exposed. That's how you can have the problems with the runoff uh, and the soil leaving the area. Um, other thing that can really help is don't mow the ditches and quit spraying the roads. In other words, you're using um, some type of a weed kill herbicide to get rid of certain things. Don't do that. Just keep it mowed um, on a semi-regular basis, but don't mow it like you would your yard. And you should be able to control those weeds, yet not mow it too much. That's going to get all those weeds up into the air, too. Um, continue on that same vein at a farm level things we can do instead of using the synthetic controls for the pesticides um, use bio biologic controls so you can bring in um, different insects that might control it you can bring in uh, different uh, separations that we have trees that would bring in different insects you can plant um, some flowers wildflowers that would bring in different pollinators that might help get rid of some of what you're getting in there that's a bad insect uh, and then successive production in other words you keep um, one one successive production would be uh, planting a perennial crop um, but increasing that diversification that you have and making it go from first one to the second one to the third one grow as many times as you can do that winter wheat, do the alfalfa, do the cover crop, or if you live in an area closer to the equator, make sure you use two or three sets of, don't just grow one, one crop, do two or three because you have the type of environment that would allow you to do that. Um, using non-crop areas uh, to, we talked a little bit about that a couple slides back, but providing that habitat for beneficial insects, it will, they will come back if you have a habitat they like, and then they will remove some of the bad insects that you have. You can create a riparian corridor grassway um, with native plants, and that filters some of those uh, fertilizer nutrients out if you're still using those. It also cleans up any water that comes through there and it's better for the water table that it's going to go down to. Um, and if you properly manage how your farm is, you're going to find out that sustainable is achievable everywhere. It's just not in some areas. Everywhere can be uh, if you properly manage it. Here's an example of a riparian corridor. And it's just an area and here's the water that's coming through it in the case it's coming across this road that they use. But you have your grasses here and then some of the uh, trees off to the side. The crops are on either side of this waterway. If you needed the water, you could certainly use it uh, in the fields if you're growing vegetables. But here you have some native uh, uh, types of species of plants that will help bring back those beneficial insects. Um, if we're going to create more diversification at a farm level, the cover crops that we talked about, if you do that, it's going to reduce the erosion because you're not going to have open soil. Um, any cover crop, you plant it so that it adds nitrogen to the soil, so therefore you wouldn't need to add fertilizer uh, in the spring. It would put it enough in over the winter that it would provide what you need for most crops. Uh, it also provides for an animal habitat. Um, if you put winter wheat in, there's going to be a place for all those animals to go in and be protected a little bit. Um, some believe you should not harvest all your crops and leave a little bit in there to help wildlife out in the wintertime. It, it would uh, keep more alive if you left, let's say, a quarter acre of corn or beans out there it, or wheat. It would have something for them to go in, have a little shelter, but more importantly, to have the food. Um, if you use waterways, they could help get water um, to plants if you needed it for one reason. Another thing you could use it for is that uh, some of that soil was going to would seep into the ground, and that would be used by the plants also. If you had really marginal land, in other words, land that stuff wouldn't grow on very well, you could plant perennials, which would attract wildlife, would attract insects, um, or you could revert an area if it used to be uh, a specific thing. Let's let's say it was a uh, swamp land or a wetland, you could restore it to what that was. Um, in some areas, it's real hilly. You could terrace fields. Um, and a lot of times, what happens in that terracing of the fields is you create a grassway, and that way you can control where the water runs to. You can put dams in. Yeah, you can build shrubs on walls and all kinds of things. That would help control wind. 
and that would all help um, in an area that's hilly for you to be able to grow more things without losing your soil. Um, another thing that would be a good thing is to create purchase for beneficial bird species. In other words, you can build different birds like different types of perches resting places and you could create that for them and now we're going to look at some stuff that's what's of vital importance in becoming the sustain, uh, sustainable agro uh, system and that's a pretty barn um, some of the things is we need to develop methods to change our current agroecosystem function to become more like a natural ecosystem being monocropping, using all of the external inputs, we really, really, really are the farthest we've ever been away from being a natural ecosystem, and it's not able to sustain itself. And we need to move toward that natural ecosystem as, as much as we can. Um, and we have to do our best to try to protect what is here in the ecosystem from getting worse from the non-sustainable practices. In other words, we have to talk with our neighbors and try to get them to be doing things we are to improve the quality of, of the area. And if we look here at what the disturbances are and what the area has and what it contains in terms of plants, and then what type of an area we have, we can actually start seeing what is the makeup of, of the land that we have. There's areas where we have um, intense um, disturbance. In other words, we're going in there and planting things. That's the area where we're putting in the corn, the soybeans. It's our production land. Every year we disturb it when we plant it. We disturb it if we cultivate it at all. We disturb it if we put nitrogen or some other um, pesticide, herbicide on that. It's going to change what how, what and how that area reacts. So we intensely manage it. Also, when we uh, go in and harvest the crop, we're also going to disturb it tremendously, too, with all that heavy equipment. And then there's moderate um, interference, and that's where you have native and non-native species of things growing. Like, you'd have perennials in there, but you could also have some of your native plants that help, um, you know, for wetlands, riparian corridors, and hills, that's putting in those types of plants and uh, construction projects that would allow you to be more natural, but still provide a little bit of the um, moderate disturbance so that we could create the environment we wanted. If you use the native species plants, that one way that that helps with the riparian corridors of the wetlands is that it actually has root systems that are deeper, so water will be able to be uh, soaked in or saturate into an area better than if you didn't have those native species. And then there's areas where there's little or no disturbance. Um, basically, it's generally native, um, and non-native species are a few, so it mostly is native things, it's borders, um, your homestead where you live, um, the roadsides, um, field border, borders or hedgerows um, would be examples of ones where there's not too much interference. And why it's little and then goes to none is it's going to be a little bit of a, when you put a new hedgerow in, let's say, it's certainly going to change it, but it would change it for a little bit and then it would get used to it and then it would be fine. Um, some of your... Um, other things you can do for, for different patterns or arrangements for your um, components are you can create strips or patches. That depends on the land that you have. You might have land that is, isn't very um, farmable. It's never been good soil, so you can put strips of or patches of maybe it be pasture land, that type of thing. Um, you want to have moderate or reduced human interference uh, in all agriculture production areas so the less you disturb it the less we go in and mess with it as humans the better off it's going to be and then um, you want to take natural areas agriculture areas and separate them from the moderate influence in other words the grassways the riparian uh, ways those type of wetlands and stuff so that it could help you have the beneficial organisms in between those other two things. Um, 
two patterns of variables are going to be predominant. It's either going to be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous means the same, two like things, and heterogeneous means two different things. Examples of homogeneous is heavy fertilizer use. Um, you irrigate over large areas using the farm technology. Um, you have narrow strips or patches of non-crop. It might be those waterways. And Midwest is a great example of a homogeneous um, arrangement for how we do things. And then you also have heterogeneous where it's using traditional farming methods with minimal industrial inputs and using uh, non-crop lands for buffer zones. And here are our attributions. I went to 